Good morning, Lama Jigme Gyatso of the Buddha Joy Meditation School. A fellow on Facebook asked me a question. He asked, how do we end suffering? If you haven't already, I recommend watching my video on the subject of the First Noble Truth in nutshell. Although many um, stupid white people translate the Pali word dukkha for suffering, many scholars prefer the phrase stress, or even subtle stress. The Buddha taught us that not getting what we want when we want it, or not keeping what we like for as long as we like, or enduring what we don't like can be a source of subtle stress. Well, why is that? Well, an anthropologist will tell you, or a biologist will tell you, or a psychologist will tell you that our brainstem has evolved to um, give us impulses to push danger away from us, or ourselves away from danger, and to pull that which we need towards us, or pull us towards that which we need. So this is pretty much hardwired into our central nervous system. Now, one of my favorite Buddhist texts is the Greater Discourse upon the Four Bases of Mindfulness. In Pali, it's known as the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. It is one of the few Buddhist texts that claims both to be the complete path to liberation and that liberation is attainable in less than seven years, or seven months, or seven weeks, or even seven days. That, in and of itself, pretty radical. But wait, there's more. In it, the emphasis is on mindfulness, insight, and love. It's not on picking and choosing what we experience. In fact, it's the opposite of choosing what we experience. We're allowing our experience to be spontaneous. Spontaneous slow or spontaneous quickly. Spontaneous pleasurable or spontaneously painful. For my friends, once we tell ourselves, I only want to experience this and none of that, what we're building for us is a cage or a prison cell. And that's the prison cell's only place where we're allowed to feel happiness. Here's the irony. When you get really good at the path, you can find peace, you can find joy in the midst of fear and sorrow. It is counterintuitive, but consistently observable. In Tibet, there's a common way of explaining a contemplative's life. They say a contemplative, everything a contemplative does fits into two categories. That which we do during the meditation session, and that which we do during the meditation break. The best explanation of what we do during the meditation session is mindfulness, or mindfulness inside and love, or to put it in the vernacular, noticing, relaxing, and intending good things for everyone. What do we do during the meditation break? We practice the simplicity of a centered spontaneity and its consequential compassion and patience. That sounds like a mouthful that could be dismissed as flowery jargon, but I assure you it's not. I'm, I don't like pain. Oh sure, call me a pussy, call me provincial, I don't like pain. I found that to take these teachings to heart is the most efficient way to be authentic and to be in touch with what some people call Source, or Tao, or Dharmakaya, or Buddha Nature, and to flow. It doesn't prevent any positive, it doesn't pr promote a positive emotion, it doesn't prevent a negative emotion, or the contrary, but it makes it doable. It makes it very doable. So the question is, should not be, how do we put an end to suffering? A better question would be, how do we dance with suffering so that it benefits us and helps us be the happy campers, productive members of society that we were born 
to be. Not necessarily from society's perspective, but from the perspective of the great luminaries of the past. From the perspective of Lao Tzu or Gautama, who would be called Buddha, from the perspective of Jesus Christ, from the perspective of Mother Teresa, from the perspective of Gandhi. From the perspective of these luminaries, though long dead, still talked about now, still relevant, though they are with us corporeally no more, that's what Buddha offers us. And <clears throat> the fourth noble truth is just a way of exploring, um, noticing, relaxing, and, and, and loving attentions from another perspective. That's all. So that's it. And what you want to do is practice skillfully, at least an hour every morning, at least an hour every night, and as the need arises throughout the day. There's a common fear that if you do that, um, you'll become a recluse and live in the park and grow a long beard. But what I found is the opposite, is that the more you do this, the more things work. Better than you could have imagined. Better than you could have goal set. Better than you could have dream boarded. Everything the Buddha do in meditation school does is free. Participate in the next series of weekly meditation classes, either in person or over your, uh, over the webinar, what's it called? Over the webinar platform via your webcam, if you have a laptop. That's the best way to practice. If you don't have a laptop, then a smartphone will do. It's okay. Not best, but it'll work. Anywho. You can find out more information on that below the video on this YouTube page. There's a button that reads Show More. Click that and it reveals what uh, John Green calls the doodly doo. May you and yours be healthy and happy. Bye bye now.